<clears throat> Thank you for that introduction. Um, so when I was sitting here this morning listening to these um, fascinating talks, I did start to wonder how I was going to talk about LinkedIn to anything. Um, but then I heard um, Sinead talk about the priorities and um, felt a bit of relief when I heard that one of the priorities was about study design. Um, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Well, one very small aspect of good study design, um, and that's in the cluster randomized trial. Um, so thinking about when the stepped wedge design is a good study design. So I thought I might start with a bit of history. So this is the very first stepped wedge trial. Um, it was launched in 1986. It's called the Gambia Hepatitis Intervention Study. And essentially, it was an attempt to roll out a vaccine program in the Gambia in a way in which all of the regions of Gambia would ultimately receive this vaccination program. So the diagram here shows the 17 regions of the Gambia. The entire country participated. And over a period of about four years, each of the regions was gradually and randomly rolled out to the extent that when that region was rolled out to deliver the vaccine program, all of the babies in that particular region were offered the vaccine program. And then it ended up with about 60,000 babies in the intervention arm and 60,000 babies in the control arm. Um, they justified their study design, which is the focus of what I'm talking about today, because that there was no other way to provide um, instantaneous and universal vaccine in the country because of logistical problems. So that was their justification for using the stepped wedge design. Um, it's a little bit unfortunate. The outcome was um, liver cancer established at 30 years. Unfortunately, this trial will probably never report because of the complexities around trying to gather that outcome for such a large population in that type of setting. Um, so before I go on, I thought I would just define what a stepped wedge trial is. So this is just a basic schematic. There are 80 clusters in this example here. Clusters can be geographical communities, they can be hospitals, they can be wards. And the clusters are randomly allocated to one of these sequences. There happens to be four sequences in this example here, but there can be more or less. Um, and then depending on what sequence the cluster has been allocated to, randomly allocated to the sequence, that dictates the time at which that cluster will receive the intervention. And ultimately, all clusters cross over to the intervention. So the darker shaded area here is exposure to the intervention. The lighter shaded period, lighter shaded cells are exposure to the control condition. So the popularity of the stepped wedge study is clearly glowing, growing. So this is just a citation analysis in PubMed. Um, citations to stepped wedge and um, classified as randomized control trials so it excludes any methods publications and you can see a clear upward trend over the past sort of decade or so. Um, but why is care needed before choosing the study design? So it became very fashionable for a time um, but we really need to think carefully about choosing this type of study design for our evaluation however popular it might be and however tempting it can be to adopt it. And so the problem with this design, if you look at this schematic representation here, is you see that the lightest shaded cells, they're the control condition. The darker shaded controls are the intervention condition. Now, outcomes might change over time. They might only change a small amount, but often we're only looking to detect small changes. So we need to be really careful about these changes over time. We might call those secular trends that might occur irrespective of our intervention. Now, the thing is, with this design, the outcomes under the control condition are collected at a systematically earlier time than the outcomes under the intervention condition. And so because of the secular trend that can happen at the same time, this randomized design, unfortunately, induces a confounder. So mostly we use randomization because it balances out confounders across our treatment arms, but this design has the opposite effect. It induces a confounder. So everything that we must do in our analysis must take care to allow for these confounding effects of times. So we might think of it as a little bit more like an observational study. So that's the reason why we need to justify it. So what do we need to justify? So first of all, we need to justify the use of cluster randomization. 
then we need to justify the use of the need to roll out the intervention to all our cluster, uh, clusters. And finally, for the staggered rollout. So those are the three things that I want to talk to you today about how we justify these three things. And so then um, there have been a couple of papers where we have reflected on this in the, in the methods literature, one by myself and Monica Talliard, um, and then another by Richard Hooper and Sandra Eldridge. So much of what I'm going to talk about has been covered in these two articles. So when is cluster randomization justified? So that's the first question. So I like to divide it up into two components. Firstly, thinking about when it's absolutely necessary to use cluster randomization. Now, so under these types of necessary conditions, it's probably not possible to run an individually randomized trial. So for example, if we're trying to evaluate a cluster level intervention, so something at a very, very high level that we can't possibly divide up at the individual level. So for example, maybe a new type of EHR system. So something at a very high level. Or where we're interested in what we say are the, both the indirect and the direct effects. So for example, if we're trying to evaluate the effect of a vaccine, we want to understand how that protects the individual, but we might also be interested in how that also might lead protection in individuals around that individual. So there we might think about contamination, but a type of contamination that is our virtue. It's a beneficial type of contamination. So this is where we're interested in the direct and indirect effects. And we probably cannot do that type of design in that type of way under an individually randomized design. So those are the necessary conditions but they're also what we might consider to be sufficient conditions. So here, under these types of conditions, it might be possible to do an individually randomized design, but maybe it's just really difficult. And so the typical one here is contamination. So here we're concerned that those participants in our control arm might inadvertently be exposed to in our intervention. And if that happened, then our effect would be diluted or attenuated. So this is one of the common reasons. And another simply is because of logistics. Cluster randomization can often help with the feasibility and facilitate just a simple trial delivery. So that's another reason that's often put forward. So once we've decided that cluster randomization is necessary, we then move on to the next question. So when is a stepped wedge design necessary or justified? So the first justification is often around statistical efficiency or power. So there are some conditions when the stepped wedge design has more statistical power than a parallel cluster randomized trial. Now, there are a few situations where this is typically the case. The first one is where we've got a very limited number of clusters. The second is where our intra-cluster coefficient is very high, so our ICC is very high. And the third is where we have got a large cluster size. So those are just rough rules of thumb, but nonetheless, there are rough rules of thumb that often can work just at that first stage to give you an idea of whether or not the stepped wedge design might be more statistically efficient compared to the cluster design, the parallel design. The second one is logistics and feasibility. Again, big feature. So under some conditions, the stepped wedge cluster randomized design might just simply enhance the feasibility of the trial conduct. Another, t another reason why, or similar to the reason why we might adopt cluster randomization in the first place. And so this is particularly the case when it might just be difficult to roll out that intervention to all of our clusters at the same time under a parallel design. So that's the second reason. And the third is what I've called social appeal. So the fact that every cluster ultimately receives this intervention under a stepped wedge design seems to have an appeal. And this is particularly the case when there's a belief that this intervention is going to do more good than harm or it's desirable. So those are the three main reasons. So let's try and pick those apart a little bit. So when is it appropriate to justify a stepped wedge design because of its statistical efficiency? Well, sometimes it can actually help with our statistical efficiency. Um, but... In order to be sure that this is the case, we need to do accurate statistical power calculations. And when we're doing those power calculations, we must provide a sort of fair comparison across the two types of designs. Now, in a parallel design, we're used to including ICCs in those calculations. When it comes to a stepped wedge design, their power calculations are more complicated. We have to allow for the fact that we've got to adjust for time in our analysis. That decreases our power. We have to allow for these longitudinal correlations. And we also have to allow for something called small sample corrections. 
So we have to consider all of those aspects and then do a sort of fair comparison of the power across the two different designs. And it often needs to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. So although we can use those rules of thumb to give us some idea, once we've decided that it might well be a contender, we really must check that out thoroughly. But then, again, if the stepped wedge design turns out to be perhaps more statistically efficient than a parallel design, then why not look for a more optimal design? And there are some more optimal designs around. Um, for example, the staircase design. So the second thing is about justifying the stepped wedge design for logistical reasons. So we often use the stepped wedge design because it seems that it's going to help with our trial feasibility implementation of the trial design. But the stepped wedge design actually can encounter some logistical complexities in itself. And these are particularly recruitment challenges. So in a stepped wedge design, it's not that easy to mitigate any recruitment strat, any low recruitment. So our design has a fixed duration. We can't just extend the duration because we're not recruiting properly or to target. And there are also implementation challenges. So in this design, all of the clusters have to be ready at the start. When we conduct a multi-center trial or a parallel cluster trial, we don't have all of our centers on board at the beginning. We allow some centers to just start and then other centers to start later on down the line as and when they're ready. But that's not the case in a stepped wedge design. They need to be all ready. And again, if we're thinking about the stepped wedge design, then why not consider some other designs which might help with those logistical complexities even more? And one of these is something called the batch stepped wedge, and the other one goes back to the parallel cluster randomized trial. So this is the batch stepped wedge design. So you see it on the left-hand side, it's simply a series of batches of stepped wedge designs. So they are run so that when you, say, receive, say, the first three clusters that are ready to participate in your trial, you start a mini stepped wedge design in those handful of clusters that are ready. A little while later, when the next um, batch of clusters are ready, you repeat another small batched stepped wedge design and so on. So that can help with the implementation difficulties that you can get in a stepped wedge design because this typical stepped wedge design requires all of those clusters to be there at the beginning. On the other side, I've got this parallel design, cluster design with staggered starts. So the green here is the control observations, the orange is the intervention condition, and the blue is a sort of implementation setup phase in each of the different sites. And so this is a simple parallel design. Each of the clusters are, have an equal chance of being randomized to the intervention or control, but it's run in a staggered way. This is a, a real step to edge design. It's called the emotive design. These steps were fairly short, but it allows a staggered rollout of the intervention in those blue boxes. And this was a quite a complex intervention to embed into practice, and so, and so they needed uh, to have some sort of staggered start in, the, in, the, um, in their design. And the parallel design allowed for that. So it's not just the stepped wedge design that allows for those staggered starts. And many people have been using designs like this for years without even really appreciating that it allowed for those staggered starts. And then finally, this justifying the stepped wedge design because of its social appeal. So as a reminder, that social appeal is the fact that every cluster is ultimately going to receive the intervention under the stepped wedge design. So an example I came across just a couple of weeks ago was a team that were trying to evaluate the provision of glasses to children in rural China, children that often didn't have glasses. Um, they had funding to do a parallel design, but then at the last minute, the gatekeepers of those clusters insisted that to have access to those schools was only on the condition that all children ultimately receive the intervention, the glasses at some point. So there's some sort of paradox here, maybe a potential therapeutic misconception. So the scientific view is that we should be in the position of equipoise. The intervention must have unknown benefit in order for us to do this randomized evaluation. So there's no reason to give all of the clusters this intervention. But the community view is that these interventions are often seen as desirable. And so there's this increase in appeal when these clusters ultimately receive the intervention. So how do we balance those two things? So um, rounding up then, so what are the most common reasons why people adopt a stepped wedge design? 
So in the first column, the N equals 32 trials, this is um, the reported reasons for stepped wedge designs conducted up to 2017, and the N equals 55 are the studies, the stepped wedge trials that reported between 2017 and 2022, I think it was. So pretty similar between, between the two cohorts of stepped wedge design, slightly increase in the um, reporting of some reason, some sort of rationale. Um, so almost all designs nowadays are giving some sort of rationale for using a stepped wedge design, which isn't bad. Um, common reasons are that all sites get the intervention, um, logistical reasons, um, statistical efficiency. Um, so most of the reasons that I've spoken about here. Um, and also this opportunistic evaluation. We might put the Gambia hepatitis down into, into that category. So there are a range of reasons for why it's been adopted. Um, and so this common misconception then is that the stepped wedge um, is ethically appropriate when the intervention is expected to do more good than harm. And I think perhaps we might need to challenge this, um, what I think probably is a misconception. So in some sort of like um, scenario where we might have the um, statistician talking to the um, investigator, the investigator um, comes along saying something like, oh, I think every single cluster needs to get this intervention. Um, it's a strong ethical argument, everyone needs it. You know, we've got this idea that it's going to be beneficial. Well, and then in that case, perhaps we might respond, well, maybe everyone should get the intervention. But it actually, it is very tricky because um, even in my example just a couple of weeks ago, it is very tricky to, to know what to do when you're in that sort of situation. Um, so then summarizing then, um, stepped wedge design is becoming an increasingly common design choice but really need to take some care about adopting it. It does have this issue of secular um, temporal confounding and a host of other things I've only very briefly mentioned here. So these longitudinal correlations within cluster contamination and another thing called time varying treatment effects. So that temporal confounding is just one of the complexities of the design. So its justification really needs to be very carefully thought about um, parallel cluster randomized trial has many appeals. It's just the sort of bog standard design. I think it lost favor for a little while, but actually we shouldn't underestimate how appealing it can be. It can often be more statistically efficient, not all of the time, but often when you do a fair comparison, it's not that bad and it makes far fewer assumptions. Um, so thank you. And then might finally um, end up with a uh, QR code here for a um, survey on the right-hand side, which is about interpretation of statistical significance. If you are a statistician at a CTU, it would be really welcome if you would participate in that. And on the right-hand side is an advertisement for a course that we run in Birmingham on cluster trials. Thank you. <laughs>